Hello there, welcome back to another Wrong Sports episode. This time I'm going back to my Discontinued series. And if you haven't seen, I have a few Discontinued episodes done already. You can check out the full playlist to the side. I've done NYU, Chicago, Santa Clara, uh, Tampa. Check them all out to the side. This time, though, I'll be covering a school that is more well-known right now for their basketball program and for being a longtime member of the Big East Conference. This week, I'm going to be going over the story of the Marquette University football team, a team that actually played throughout World War II, unlike a lot of teams in college football during that time, and I'll go over a little bit more about that as we get into this episode. But before I get to the full story of the Marquette University football team, make sure you check out my podcast right now. It's available on Apple, Google, Spotify. Just search Wrong Sports. You can also check out the link below, and make sure you help out the channel right now on my Patreon, patreon.com slash wrong sports. And as always, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel below. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a comment. Also, tell us some ideas about what teams you want me to cover or games you want me to cover, or really anything about college football that you want me to cover in the future. And check me out on Twitter at Sports Wronged. But Marquette opened up as Marquette College on August 28th, 1881, and would quickly start to grow. One way they did that was that Marquette became the first co-educational Catholic university in the world in 1909, when it began admitting its first female students. They didn't start female sports just yet, but they would start the reason for this video, is they would start a football team only 11 years after they opened with their first team starting in 1892. Now, the team was quite young and the school really didn't know what they were doing, so there wasn't a coach, but they did probably have an academic advisor as they only played three games, going one and two, beating Loyola of Illinois and losing twice to Milwaukee High School by a shutout. So the start wasn't going all that well, but the Marquette team continued playing through the rest of the 1800s and into the new century, but it wasn't really every year. And if they played in a year, it wasn't many games, maybe four or five games. Those were most of the results that I could find during this time. They would hire their first coach though in 1901, in Jerry Riordan. Now they may have had a coach or two before Riordan, but I couldn't find definitive info on that. So I'm gonna go with Riordan as being the first coach. And he was a former Wisconsin Wisconsin player and captain on the Wisconsin team in 1899. He would coach Marquette in 1901 and 1903 as he went 4-0-1 in his first year and 7-1 in 1903. The school would flip-flop on coaches every year or so during the first decade of the 1900s, but they would have some winning records most of those years, as 1901 through 1904, they had a winning record and they were undefeated in 1907. But going into the next decade, they would get a lot better with their first real coach in William Juno. And he was like a lot of coaches that Marquette would hire in this time, as he was a former Wisconsin Badger player that was hired by Marquette in 1908 and kept the team winning through their first decade but he would really hit his stride with the start of the 1910s. The 1910 season started with the team going 4-0-1 and the team dominating most of their games, but in Game 6 versus Michigan Agricultural College, which is now known as Michigan State, Marquette met their match. The game was at home, but gusts of 40 miles an hour may have been an issue for the lack of offense, as Marquette's only points were on a safety in the first half, but Michigan Agricultural College would make a long field goal to win this game 3-2. After that loss, Marquette continued to roll along through their season, until they would meet Notre Dame in their final game. And this was Notre Dame before New Rockney was the coach. New Rockney, though, was on the sideline as he was a seldom used player during the season. The game was hard fought, but it would end in a tie, and Marquette was 6 1 and 2 on the year. The next season started really good for Marquette as they were 4-0 before a scoreless tie versus Villanova, but then they didn't lose again and met Notre Dame in their finale once again. Notre Dame was also unbeaten with a tie, so this game was going to be for the best team in the Midwest. Unfortunately, no winner was found yet again as it went to a 0-0 tie and Marquette ended with a 7-0-2 record and Notre Dame would also end with an unbeaten record. The rest of the 1910s though, 
though, had a lot of changing at coach, as William Juno would leave after the 1911 season to go back to his alma mater. And then the school would go through four coaches the rest of the decade, but they did hire their first alumni as coach in the 1913 season in Leander J. Foley. And he would produce a 4-3-1 record in his only season. Marquette would finally find a good coach, though, towards the end of the decade in John J. Ryan. They would hire him in 1917, and he would start with an unbeaten season in 1917 as they went 8-0-1, only giving up one touchdown all season. The team's unbeaten streak continued through the war-shortened 1918 season, as the team would only play three games and won all of them. Their unbeaten streak, though, would meet their match in the second game of the 1919 season, as they would face Wisconsin. Wisconsin would score two touchdowns on Marquette, and Marquette only gave up three total touchdowns all season. Marquette couldn't match Wisconsin, and they would lose for the first time in over two years. Marquette, though, would go unbeaten throughout the rest of the 1919 season to end the decade in style. John J. Ryan would follow the team into the next decade, coaching them from 1917 through 1921, with the team going 28-5-5. With Marquette improving through the last decade, they would get into the 1920s by finding their best coach in 1922, and his name being Frank Murray. Under Murray, the team would start on fire with an unbeaten season in 1922 and going undefeated in 1923, beating the likes of Boston College, as well as a former discontinued team on here, Detroit. During these two years, the team was 16-0-1 with 14 shutouts, and they only gave up 15 points in those two seasons. They weren't considered to be at the level of Notre Dame or a Big Ten team, so they don't really get national title consideration or really any recognition except in the Midwest. To help them get some credibility though, they would schedule Navy, and they would beat them in 1924, but would lose to them in 1925, but it would only bring on more teams from across the nation to come to Marquette, or for Marquette to go to them, and for Marquette to finally gain some credibility nationwide. They would further gain credibility in 1926 as they would schedule Auburn, Oregon State, and travel to play Army. Unfortunately, Marquette would only beat Auburn that year, but they were still gaining a lot of credibility and also winning a lot throughout the rest of the 1920s, which would get them ready for the 1930s as their team would finally hit their best stride in this decade. But before we get to the 1930s, their best player would come onto campus in the 1929 season, as Marquette would have their first great player, but he also played basketball and track. His name was Gene Taffy Rosani. Ronzani was a rare athlete that got a varsity letter in every sport every year he was on campus. He would help the basketball team have a winning record every season he played, and he was a track star in the 1930s when the track team was also really good. But he was really the star of the football team, as Frank Murray immediately saw his talent and had him carry the ball and help the team immensely as they would start the 1930 season with a 6-0 record, having five shutouts. But Game 7 was significant, as they would play a Big Ten team in Iowa at home, and it was also their homecoming game. 17,000 people would show up and the game was hard fought, with the defenses holding it to 0-0. Zero to zero. But then Tuffy Ronzani would break the tie, Marquette would hold them off, and finally win 7 to nothing. and this was their biggest win to date. But unfortunately, after that big win, their undefeated season would get ruined as they would suffer a tie against Detroit. But they wouldn't lose the rest of the season for a final record of 8-0-1. Going into 1931, Ranzani was still there, and he was a junior, as they would continue their unbeaten streak with two more shutouts to start the 1931 season. They then ran into University of Detroit, but this time the game wouldn't end in a tie, and that was because Detroit had a 7-0 lead with just minutes to go. Marquette had the ball and were making their move towards the goal line but they were just two feet away from the goal line as the whistle sounded, and Marquette couldn't get in the end zone, suffering their first loss in two years. 
They unfortunately had to keep the season going, though, and they would play Boston College and then Ole Miss at home and easily took care of them to give them more significant wins, but unfortunately they would end the season 8-1, and one, one of their best teams ever as they also had five shutouts, but unfortunately the loss to Detroit really hurt them in nationwide polling. But 1932 was the senior season of Tuffy Ronzani. And it wasn't like the last two as they started with a tough loss to Wisconsin and then lost two more times this season to have their most losses in four years and their most losses with Ronzani on the field as they ended the season 4-3-1. and one. Ronzani would leave after the season and play for the Chicago Bears for six seasons as well as coach the Green Bay Packers after the legend Curly Lambeau stepped down in the 1950s. The next two years of 1933 and 1934 were losing ones, but they started to play more well-known teams, especially out of the Midwest, like Wisconsin, Michigan State, and Kansas State. After these losing seasons, though, their coach Frank Murray would find his next great star in quarterback Ray Buzz Bouvied. Buzz came to campus and wasn't a real starter until the 1935 season, but would throw 13 touchdowns that season, half of the team's total, but was only second in college in touchdown passing this season behind Sammy Baugh, who also had a legendary season. Behind Buzz at QB, Marquette would start 6-0, beating the likes of Wisconsin by shutout, Kansas State, Ole Miss, Iowa State, and Michigan State. But in Game 7, they played Temple with the legendary coach Pop Warner still around, who played tough passing defense, and it worked out to beat Marquette 26-6, which would be Marquette's only loss that season. After the great 1935 season, Frank Murray would have his most famous team at Marquette in 1936. The season started with a huge win over their in-state rival Wisconsin. After that, Marquette would play two more games at Soldier Field in Chicago and draw big numbers, like 30,000 fans for a game versus St. Louis and 50,000 for a game versus St. Mary's out of California. The second game though really made the season for Marquette, as St. Mary's was coming in ranked. And this game was a real coming out party for Buzz Bouvied, as he was responsible for all three touchdowns in the game. He started with a touchdown run to make it 7 to nothing. then he intercepted a St. Mary's pass to run it back for a second touchdown, and then he deflected a third touchdown pass. And yes, Marquette would hold off St. Mary's to win 20-6 to and continue this undefeated season. And the season was running on a high, and they wouldn't suffer a loss after that high, as they would win their next two games to be 7-0 when they traveled to Pittsburgh to play Duquesne. Duquesne was ranked due to them beating their rival Pitt, and also they were getting an invite to the Orange Bowl this year too, so Duquesne was a really good team. The game had the largest crowd to see a Duquesne game, and the Dukes delivered as they shut out Marquette as they beat him 13-0. The loss ruined Marquette's perfect season, but Marquette was still invited to their first bowl game in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl versus TCU. And the 1936 Cotton Bowl was a huge game, not only for Marquette, but also for TCU and also for pretty much the whole country, because this was going to be seeing a game between the two most prolific passers of the year and also two Heisman finalists. But neither would win, as Buzz Bouvied would finish third, and Sammy Baugh would finish right behind him at fourth. The Heisman voting didn't go the same way as the game would, as TCU dominated most of it, with Sammy Baugh throwing a pass, and the only points Marquette could get on the board were a punt return for a touchdown. With the Marquette loss, it ended their season 7-2, but they would be ranked number 20 and their first bowl game appearance as well this season. After this game, there would be a lot of huge news on campus. First off would be that Buzz Bouvied would graduate, and he would get drafted in the top five of the NFL draft this season. But bigger news was that their coach, Frank Murray, would also be leaving, this time to be the head coach of the University of Virginia. As soon as Murray left, Marquette would quickly move to hire former Northwestern alumni Patty Driscoll. Driscoll would go to Marquette looking to keep the winning mindset, but it didn't work out so well for him, at least in his first year, as the 1937 season had them go back to a 3-7 record. And they had a lot of roster turnover going into 1938, as they would relapse even further to a 1-7 record. But the 1939 season would see their only 500 season, but heading into season four under Driscoll, this would be the real breaking point, not only for Driscoll, but also for the school, because the team would start 1-1-1, one, one, and one, only beating Iowa State. But after that, the team sputtered to a three-game losing streak, and Driscoll was on the hot seat. 
Marquette would end up beating Michigan State, though November 16th at home, and the next day the school announced that Driscoll has put in his resignation, and the school accepted it. So at least he would leave on a winning note, but the team lost their last two games to be 2-6-1, and, and the start of the 1940s decade wasn't going so well, as they were now looking for another new coach. The 1941 season would start the run of a new coach in Thomas Stidham. Stidham was from Oklahoma and went to Haskell and then coached at Oklahoma after school. As the Sooners coached, he led them to an undefeated season in 1938 and an invite in the Orange Bowl. But Stidham came to Marquette with some high regard as he was coming from Oklahoma and the school was looking to win again. But instead they got another losing season, this time only winning four games and playing some more big time teams like Michigan State, Ole Miss, and Stidham's old team Oklahoma with Marquette losing all of these games. And even with the losses, the school and the fan base were still supporting this team, kind of, because 20,000 fans showed up for a game versus Duquesne this season, but then the next week, only 7,500 fans showed up for a game versus Old Miss. So it was kind of a mixed bag this season, and pretty much for the rest of the time this football team was around. But after the 1941 season, America would go into World War II, and it would also bring some big changes to the campus of Marquette and also to the college football landscape. The big change would be that Marquette would be one of the V5 training schools for naval officers, meaning that the school would have more men on campus because the men would be doing training. And if you want to know more explanation on being a V5 or a V12 school, I have a whole bunch of explanations in my three-part service teams documentary, which I'll put a link to above, and it's also in the side in the playlists. But most of the time, schools would benefit being a V5 or V12 school due to there being more men on campus, so they played football. And Marquette would benefit from the extra men on campus, as 1942 brought them their best team in a while, as they started with four games on the road and the rest of them at home. The reason for this was probably due to wartime travel. The games on the road were against teams they usually faced, like Michigan State, Wisconsin, Kansas, and Iowa State. And Marquette would come out of that 3-1, only losing to Wisconsin. This would put them in great standing as they came home for a five-game stretch, and they would dominate to start with back-to-back -back shutouts over Arizona and Detroit. So now Marquette was 6-1, and one, and they played the Great Lakes Navy team. Again, another team I went over in my service documentaries because they were one of the best service teams during that time. And it showed because Great Lakes was a really good squad, and they had a few pro players on their team, and Marquette couldn't handle it as they suffered a 24 nothing loss. Marquette ended with a win over another service team in Camp Grant to be 7-2 and two this season as World War II kept going, more men were needed and needed to be shipped off and not play football anymore. Due to that, Marquette would be stagnant with losing records in 1943 and 1944, but with the war ending, the 1945 season ended with something good. Not only was the war over, but Marquette got hot to end the season, going 4-0 after starting 1-4-1 to end their season with a winning record. But this would also spell the end for their coach Thomas Stidham, who would go on to a new pro league called the all American Football Conference. But Marquette was looking at green pastures now that the war was over, and more college-age men were coming back to campus. Along with that, they had to find a new coach. And lucky for them, their all-time winningest coach, Frank Murray, was ready to come back. Murray would coach the team starting in 1946 after coaching UVA for the last nine seasons and having a winning record there. Not sure of the reason for his departure from Virginia, but he did love Marquette and he left Virginia in good hands as Art Gepp would become the new coach of University of Virginia and their connection was that Murray coached Art Gepp as a player at Marquette during the 1936 Cotton Bowl season, so now more Marquette alumni were starting to become coaches. But anyway, Murray was back on campus and ready to turn the fortunes of this team around. And long story short, it didn't work for Murray this time, as he coached the team for four seasons, not having a winning record. But the best record he could manage was four and five, and he did that three out of the four seasons he would be there. Murray would leave after the 1950 season, and he would unfortunately die in 1951, just two years after his final season at Marquette, and he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame decades later. And now we're getting into a new decade, the 1950s, and Marquette was going to have to look for another new coach, except this time the coach would have a lot of work to do, because he was going to have to rehab this Marquette program big time, because the teams that they would be playing in the future were teams that got really good after the war really, really quickly, and Marquette couldn't compete with them anymore. 
And it was because after World War II and into the 1950s, it really got noticeable which teams and which conferences were going to be the blue bloods of college football. And this was because most of their teams were willing to spend the money and get the good time coaches. And Marquette wasn't going to be one of those schools that were going to spend a lot of money to get a big time coach, as instead they looked locally for their next big coach, hiring Liz Blackburn. Blackburn was a Wisconsin native and coached Wisconsin high school football for 20 years before that and then became a scout at Wisconsin, finally ending up at Marquette for the 1949 season, being an assistant under Murray. Coach Blackburn was picked as the next coach as he had a lot of experience at coaching not only in the state, but he also had experience in scouting and also recruiting in the state as well. And Blackburn did pretty well in his first season as the team started 3-1, but eventually fell to 5-3-1 with one of their wins versus a well-known school in Kansas State, and that would be their only win versus a big-time conference, as they lost three of their games to Big Ten schools or future Big Ten schools, as Michigan State wasn't in the Big Ten just yet. And the next two years didn't get really any better and started to show that Marquette was starting to be left behind, as they went 4-6-1 in 1951 and 3-5-1 in 1952 after starting 3-1 again. But going into the 1953 season, they saw a little change as the school announced that they would be changing the name of their mascot from the Hilltoppers to the Warriors, and that would be starting the next season in 1954. Now, that mascot change must have helped the team because they started 2-0, but then they went on the road to play two Big Ten schools in Wisconsin and Indiana. They would lose by two to Wisconsin, and then lose by an extra point to Indiana to drop them to 2-2. Two two. But those close losses really didn't hinder the team as they went 4-0-1 after that to be 6-2 when they would meet Big Ten co-champions that year, Michigan State. And this game would go like the other Big Ten games this year as Marquette fought hard only to lose 21-15. They ended the season 6-3-1, but it was their best record in a decade and started to show that Blackburn maybe could turn this team around. And speaking of that, the turnaround made Coach Blackburn a pretty hot commodity. So much so that the Green Bay Packers made a call to him and made him their next head coach, taking over for another former Marquette alumni in Gene Ranzani. And obviously Blackburn took the job, so Marquette would have to go find another new coach. And this time Marquette went in a different direction for their coach, instead of hiring Green Bay high school coach Frosty Frozaka. Frozaka almost became an assistant at Marquette a few years before this, but stayed in high school, and he probably should have stayed because the two seasons he spent in Marquette were pretty bad. In 1954, they started the season 0-3, and, and that would lead them to a 3-5-1 season. And after that, it just kept getting worse as they were 2-6-1 in 1955 after getting shut out three times. And with the losses starting to pile up and Frozaka looking for a way out and also probably to save his coaching career, he would leave for a job at the Packers and eventually coach at Northern Michigan after that for about a decade. So it was probably a good thing he got out of Marquette when he did. And now we're only halfway through the 1950s and the team was looking for their third head coach. And this time they went to the college level as they would hire Notre Dame assistant John F. Drews. Drews came into a bad program that hit rock bottom. And when Drews was hired, he came into a pretty bad situation that only got worse and would hit the bottom of the barrel in 1956, as the team started 0-3, losing by a total combined score of, get this, 115-7. to They would finish the season 0-6 to beat 0-9 this season, giving up 34 points per game. This was the worst season the school ever had. And after that, the school may have been looking for a change, but not at coach. Instead, they changed where they were going to play football, as they announced for the 1957 and 1958 season that they would be playing at the new city stadium in Milwaukee instead of the Marquette Stadium on campus. The stadium change really did nothing to help them, as in 1957 they went winless again, this time going 0-10, and, and in the four games played at the bigger city stadium, they drew under 11,000 fans for all of those games, and they also drew under 5k for a game versus Penn State. Coach Drews brought the team into 1958 with a 20-game losing streak, but they would finally break the streak in Game 1. So they started the year on something good at least, but the winning didn't last long as they would quickly get shut out by Wisconsin the next week, and then finish the season 2-7-1, getting shut out two more times that season. 
Coach Drews would leave campus after the season, and Marquette was now looking for someone that could right the ship. Because of this, the school went out and hired Liz Blackburn back, who was coaching at Carroll College in Wisconsin after being pushed out by the Green Bay Packers. Blackburn was talked back to Marquette and looked at it as someone that could right the ship. He just needed some time to do that. Well, the 1959 season brought all their games back to Marquette Stadium, and they held their first two games there, looking for a change, but they didn't really get that as they lost those games, and they drew less than 10,000 fans for both of those games. So even with the coaching change and the location change, the fans really weren't coming back. And the team would start 0-7 that season before winning their last three games, so at least they saved this season and ended the decade on a high note with that three-game winning streak. When the 1960s kicked off, there were rumors about the program losing a lot of money, especially the decade previous to this, and needing this year to really save them, which is never a good sign for a program, especially ones that I go over in this discontinued series. But this new decade and new season would bring back Liz Blackburn to be coaching on the sideline, and also brought back a star from their team in 1959, in slotback and deed lineman George Andre. He was the team's receiving leader in 1959, and also their second leading tackler. So yeah, he was clearly the star on this team. To start the 1960 season, the team would start really well, going 3-1, drawing over 10,000 for their first game versus Villanova, and a second game versus BC, they they drew just under 15,000. But after the hot start, the team started to fall apart as they weren't able to score and went 0-5, ending the year 3-6. and And once again this season, George Andre was the leading receiver, scorer, and tackler as he had over 80 tackles this season. After that tough end to the 1960 season, it was no more than a month after the final game that the president of Marquette, Reverend Edward J. O'Donnell, announced that the school would be dropping football and track in 1961 and beyond. The students and most of the staff were shocked as 3,000 students would come out to protest it. The school wouldn't budge though, as they said the reason was because of a $50,000 deficit the year previous, and they would also be seeing bigger losses coming in the future unless they got rid of the football team. In addition, the school was going through a major $30 million fundraising drive to expand their academics, so they really didn't want to have to fund a losing football team either. And also to go along with that, another reason why Marquette might have gone away was because they weren't winning, as every time they played a team from the Big Ten or the Big Eight, or Michigan State, they would lose. The last time they beat Wisconsin was in the mid-1930s, and they would beat Michigan State only 2 out of 15 times, so that didn't look good. And one of their longtime rivals, University of Detroit, a program that would also drop their football team a year before, you can see more about that in the link above, was on a six-year winning streak over Marquette after Marquette won 10 of the previous 12 years. So that whole decade of the 1950s, a decade where Marquette didn't win, really could have saved them, as you see here. But the team wasn't coming back, and when the team was dumped, their coach, Liz Blackburn, was pretty annoyed, but he really couldn't be all that annoyed as his contract was actually honored. So he was paid for the next two years, even though there was no football team on campus. And then after that, he would go on to his next job as a scout for a great team that he had a hand in building in the Green Bay Packers. Now I say he had a hand in building it because he was actually asked to resign after the 1957 season, but he didn't. So he actually had a hand in the first part of drafting the Packers 1958 draft, which is considered one of the best drafts ever, and it gave the next coach, Vince Lombardi, all he needed to win all those titles for the Green Bay Packers. In addition, the building of the Packers may have been a sign of this program going away, as the Packers would hire Lombardi in 1959, and they'd win their first NFL title in 1960, just weeks after the school dropped football. So again, more people in the state were probably interested in the Packers, and if not the Packers, then they were interested in Wisconsin football more than Marquette football. Another thing that would hurt them would be that weird location change that they went through, as when the team was playing at the City Stadium, it was even worse for them, as they were not a good team at that time as they were on that 20 game losing streak and they were drawing less than 10,000 and less than 5,000 towards the end of those two years there, meaning that they were being a huge money loser because they could have played those games on campus and it wouldn't have been that much of a huge loss if only 5,000 fans showed up. After the 1960 season, the Marquette Stadium would be immediately useless and would be partially demolished and the site would be refurbished in 1998 to be turned into the Quad Park Track and Soccer Conference 
complex. The school played football for over six decades and would win 349 games, lose 280, and tie 39 games for a winning percentage just above 55%. Now that record might sound really good, but it doesn't show how bad this team was after World War II. As the last 20 years, this team went 67, 118, and 10 for a 37% winning percentage over those years. So that really hurt their program as you see less fans showed up and eventually it would go away. But I really wanted to cover the Marquette program because I really think it's cool that there's a lot of people, especially in the uh, 30s and the 40s that played for this team, that would go on to build the biggest team in the state, the Green Bay. Packers, as I mentioned Liz Blackburn there, drafting about half of the great players on those 1960s Packers team. And another reason why I wanted to cover Marquette was because they were one of the teams that went down during the 1960s when a lot of football teams around the country started to defund their college football program. I mentioned University of Detroit going away, also NYU went away at this time, and also a few schools out west would go away during this time as well. Those football programs I will go over in future episodes of Discontinued, so make sure you check out that. And as always, make sure you subscribe to the channel below. Please like and share this video, and of course, follow me on Twitter at SportsWronged. You can check out full podcasts right now if you just search Wrong Sports on Google or Spotify, I also have a link below as well to the podcast page. And as always, help out the channel on my Patreon, patreon.com slash wrongsports. And have a great and healthy new year, guys.